Post Malaysia is undergoing a transformation. However, this is not the first time that the national mail carrier has attempted to do so, only to find itself falling short, which has resulted in customers turning away and the company slipping into the red. But its new chief says that this time will be different and is willing to put his money where his mouth is as he works to refresh people's perception about Post Malaysia. In part one of our Talking Edge with Group CEO Charles Brewer, we ask him about Post Malaysia's legacy issues, consumer distrust in the brand, and the tricky business of managing the expectations and aspirations of its 18,000 strong staff. You've been CEO of Post Malaysia for just over six months now. Um, of course, Malaysia is not new, not new to you. Yeah, yeah you you bid here. You have a Malaysian wife as well. So it's one of those things where. But when you come into something as iconic as Post Malaysia, there's a lot of moving parts. How have you found it so far? Because there's one thing about, we were mentioning it's an iconic brand, but sometimes icons find change quite difficult. It's a very enjoyable seven months, but not without its ups and downs, as, sure. as you would appreciate. But on the whole, really, really fantastic. And I think, you know, like we were saying just before we started, Post Malaysia is that sort of iconic heritage brand but perhaps one of the things that i didn't know coming in is just how strong that pride and passion is right. uh, in the eighteen thousand plus employees and that's been something that's been overwhelming and in, in certainly the first or six seven months i've been here all right but when you came in um i think one thing that was quite obvious was you went to the ground quite fast because you wanted to know right mm. how uh how things were, were doing how how did you find it when you actually went to the to the ground. You did mention a lot of pride, but there were issues as well, right? I was asked this the other day, um, why do I do it and why do I do it so mm. much? And um, it's not, it, I, a couple of things, it's not a new thing. I've been doing it my whole sort of leadership life, uh, trying to get as close to the cold face as you possibly can. So you can really understand what's going well and what's uh, not going so well. So that's number one. Number two, you know, clearly, um, and to your point, you know, we're in sort of right in the middle of transformation. So as we sort of thinking about where do we want to take post measure, a great place to start is to listen to what your employees and your customers, both actually, your employees and customers, what they really think. So when I first came in, there was this plethora of noise on social media around, you know, Matt Saleh. And, and again, I, the I get- The first Matt Saleh of, yeah, of an iconic, of iconic brand. Absolutely. And perhaps some of my fellow Matt Saleh's have not always been seen in such a positive light. So there was there was all sorts of questions, concerns. In fact, my wife jokingly said, you perhaps should get a security guard to take care of yourself. But it's really interesting. Yeah? So I could feel that there was this sort of huge desire to want to give me feedback. So um, as I was developing the strategy, um, I decided to really connect with our employees and with our customers to really understand from their perspective what's going well and what's not going so well. And it worked out really, really well. So to, and to your point, um, you go out into the field, um, which I've done a lot of. So I've been to all the states now, done courier rides here, delivered mail, worked on the counters, worked in the hub, worked everywhere. You get so much rich feedback in terms of what is going well and what isn't going so well. Much, much more in those five or 10 minutes with a courier than you do in five or 10, 10 hours in a boardroom. So That's the big question, right? You, you mentioned it in, in passing, but I think it's the, the heart of it. What does Post Malaysia want to be? Yeah. I mean... I, it's great that you got everybody's voice and you're not wrong about the whole uh, foreign CEO coming yeah. in because we have seen them come in, we've seen them do some change and we've seen them leave just yeah. as fast. So it's not, it's not unfair for people to have that criticism as well. But what do they want? What does the collective voice of the staff and the customers that you've talked to want out of Post Malaysia? Just before I answer your question, I think, and to your comment about... Mm some of the comments are made. I, I, I got that. I, I empathise sure. with some of those remarks. I don't think they're wrong in some cases. I would like to reiterate, and again, I've said it a number of times, that <laughs> I have no plans to go anywhere. As we were talking, my wife is Malaysian, and uh, you know, I find that Malaysia is kind of my second home, so I'm very, very happy. Anyway, to the point. Um, I think the easiest way to describe it is that historically, Post Malaysia was a male company that also delivered parcels. So that's, that's our history. Our history is 200 years, more than 200 years old. Um, sending letters and delivering letters to more than 9 million addresses uh, across Malaysia. And, but increasingly, and particularly over the last sort of five, six, seven years, we've been delivering more and more of these parcels. Yeah, as, yeah, yeah. As people, the rush to shop online and COVID, I think, has even accelerated. Not think it has accelerated. It has completely. Yeah, hugely. So 
We were a mail company that also deliver parcels and going forward we'll be a parcels company that also delivers mail. That, in its most simple form, that's what we'll do. If you take that as context, the context is that we will primarily be doing this with some of this. Um, you have to be really good at this. So what have you seen in terms of tendrils of change? I mean, I know it's only been about seven months, uh, give or take, but how, what have you seen in terms of little, little improvements that make you think this is working? This uh, is definitely working. There's so many. So okay. we, we broke, so again, going back to your question around sort of taking feedback from employees and customers. From that, we, I ended up with about a list of about 250 things to do. So the first thing you need to do is sort of distill that down to what's critical. So we broke our strategy into three phases. The first one was fix the basics. You know, so if you go to a great, the easiest analogy, if you go to a restaurant, it's got the best sign outside, lots of glitter, lots of lights, lots of fantastic boom and fireworks as you get there, but you walk into the restaurant and the food's not so good, you don't go back. So you've got to have the basics, the core part of your business right. And for us, that's delivering on time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when, mm -hmm. when you order, you want the, your, your carrier to deliver it on time and with great visibility, great experience, nice smiling couriers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, and I got this straight from customers on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, LinkedIn, which is, hey, you're more than 650 retail points. They're fantastic and they're in great locations, but they the hours are quite narrow during business day, business Correct, hours. Yes. And you're and you're not open at weekends, which yeah. is kind of a bit of a miss. I mean if you're thinking about when you want to go into a retail store, it's probably going to be the weekend or after hours when you're not working. Yeah. So that was a really easy win. So that's one. Yeah. Second one is um, pick up and delivery. So we didn't used to operate uh, seven days a week. We didn't used to provide delivery service at the weekend. So again, if you're a customer and a consumer and you're ordered something, you don't if you ordered it on Friday, you don't want to wait till Monday. You're very Unforgiving. Impatient. Impatient. You're very unforgiving to us courier companies. So you want it delivered over the weekend. So we did seven days a week weekend. I think the other one, and a lot, lots and lots and lots. The other one that I would mention, which I think is probably the one I'm the most proud of. Probably the one I'm most proud of. Um, as I said earlier, the core piece of our business. So if you think about that restaurant analogy, that food, the core piece for us is that we deliver on time, yeah? And when I came in in August, very honestly, um, our service level for delivery was not so great. It was not so great. And I think to your point, and think, looking back at, you know, post Laju and post Malaysia's history, and I know some of the words that they use to describe post Laju, it's because... Not you know, very flattering. Not, not so flattering. Because we didn't really have that service reliability that a good courier company needs to have. And, and, and certainly in August when I came in, that was that was true, I think that's fair. And I heard that loudly from all of our customers that please, 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 can you improve your service level? So the operations team, um, who are fantastic by the way, we have more than 18,000 people, you know, four and a half thousand postmen, uh, doing a really fantastic job day in, day out through COVID. But the service level wasn't quite right. So we worked, it was a day two decision, let's move it and move it up really rapidly. And uh, as I sit here today, uh, I can proudly say that today, post Malaysia, post Laju, it delivers first and delivers fastest across Malaysia. It's great what you've done in the five months, the improving the on-time delivery. That, that is, I think that is your number one, right? That yeah. should be the number one thing. Perception still exists about post Malaysia in general as an organization. How do you go about changing this perception? Because you can improve your processes, but people now have other options yeah. and maybe will just not use you yeah. and realize that, oh, actually they are just as good now. So how does that, how, what, how do you do that part of your job? Yeah, and I was completely convinced, rightly wrong, well, wrong actually in, in hindsight, I was completely convinced if we move the service needle, that we would also very quickly change the perception. Yeah? And, and to your point, that sort of historical view of how post Malaysia and post Asia works. The reality is that's not true. Mm. The reality is that's not true. So yeah. um, I'm very fortunate that I have a very diverse team around me, um, uh, who some of which I brought in, some are already here, um, who are very comfortable to tell me when I'm wrong. And I have one or two people that said to me, Charles, I think we need to spend money on the, on the brand as much as improving service and making sure we focus on how we start to change that perception. So we have uh, three pillars that we're going to focus on on how we're going to do it. One is brand love. Yeah. So this is, and again, this is interesting, you know, um, which again, I perhaps didn't really appreciate when I first came in is that in the heart of every Malaysian, mm. the more than 30 million people, there is a deep love for post Malaysia. Yeah. Vis-a-vis -vis anybody else. Yeah, so I won't mention the other names, but vis-a-vis -vis the other choices you have out there, and to your comment, they do have choices. But there is a deep, inherent love 
for this brand. So, an association, I think. Yeah, an association. yeah, yeah. And whether it be, you know, the child in the kampung who grows up wanting to be the postman or the courier, there is a deep love. So we need to tap into that love and reaffirm that love. So that's pillar number one. Pillar number two, and this is to your point, is brand trust. This is really important. Correct. So whether you're B2B or B2C, whether you're a, a multinational company or a bank, as we were talking to yesterday, or an individual seller or a big platform, you need to trust that you're going to do the job. And to your point, I think over the last few years in particular, we probably have damaged that trust a, a little bit with regards to our service level. So, and as you said earlier on, there are other players in the market now. So customers have choice. So you have to work really, really hard to regain their trust. How do you regain trust? You regain the trust by doing it day in, day out. So when you do win a customer and you convince them that the service level is right, you need to make sure you keep doing it. And I was talking to uh, the state general manager for um, uh, Quantan uh, just just the other day, talking to him, we had one fail on a shipment, one shipment out of thousands failed, yeah? And he said to me, but Charles, there's only one shipment. I said, you don't get the point, uh, Biddy, because that one shipment- Will be could, what people remember, actually. Will be what people remember. They won't remember the 99.9% .9 that you did well. We had one shipment that failed. And I used it as an illustration to the rest of the operation, go back to the point around how do you change it, mm. of saying, you don't know whose shipment that was, or why it was so important. Behind every letter and every parcel, there's a story, a customer. And for all I know, that one shipment could have been a customer that's our biggest customer. It could have been a customer that's the smallest customer. It could have been a customer that we just won. It could have been a customer that's thinking about leaving us. So that it's every single letter and parcel and getting it right day in day out. So I want every single person in Post Malaysia, when you come into my retail point, A, to have a great experience. That's technology, it's process, it's other things. But the interaction with humans starts with hello and it says thank you at the end.